Okay, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Comprehensivist Wednesdays. This is done in conjunction with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. Uh, we are covering tonight our neuroscience, our monthly neuroscience topic with Sanjay. Uh, and this time we're gonna be talking about awareness, confusion, daydreaming, distraction, and clarity. Something that I'm very interested in. How do we pay attention? How do we, so many people are, trying to get our attention with our smartphones and with, uh, you know, with advertising and things along those lines. So uh, please tell us how they do it and, uh, and how we can focus better. So take it away, Sanjo. All right. Um, so, I mean, this, this topic actually is broader than it seems at first. Um, there, uh, you know, we'll talk about attention and some of the aspects around it but it really gets at the heart of uh of another topic that we've been dealing with that we're we've been grappling with really it's a complicated topic and that's that's the topic of consciousness and a lot of you will realize that attention is one aspect of consciousness but um what i will posit what i will try to show and, and it's not going to be exhaustive because uh we really don't have the time to go into a lot of detail with this but i'll try to give some uh, instances and examples, and we'll have discussion around around that, um, where attention is uh, the main facet, um, but also it's it's a little more complicated than that. Um, the regions around the brain, the, the structures in the brain, which actually uh, are responsible for giving us attention, um, it's believed that they also overlap a lot with the areas of consciousness. So it may actually be that attention that attention. Um, or awareness or, you know, focus, there, there are several words around that. It may be that that is the dominant aspect of consciousness. Um, that's still not decided or, or established yet, but um, that's a possibility. Um, and so that's something that, that I'd like to, to go into. Um, so let me uh, pull up a slide. Um, I just have to start the slideshow. Just give me a, a second here. I don't think I have any sound, but I'll, uh, yeah, okay. So you should be able to see um, the slide now, the first slide. Okay, um, all right. So uh, so for the first thing I want to go into is, is um, for those of you who read the, the description of, of the event, um, you may already be familiar with some of the, these ideas, but basically, in, in a nutshell, um, our our brain has brain has uh, mental states, um, and uh, a lot of our behavior comes out of the states that we're in, the mental states that our brain is in. Um, so, uh, and and it always has mental states. There's always a state that our brain is in. Um, also, the brain consists of multiple regions, and each of these regions can have its own state. This can lead to a lot of complex situations inside the brain. And as you'll realize, or I'm sure many people already know, this is one of the reasons why uh, our behavior can be so complicated because we can have, I mean, at, a, at the simplest level, many of you have heard of this notion of unconscious or subconscious and then conscious. Uh, you can think of those as regions, but they're not really distinct regions. Those are more, um, uh, you know, um, uh, they're simplifications, uh, they're simplified ways of looking at the brain. Um, they don't correspond specifically to individual regions. But, um, you know, we, we realize that uh, the, in the subconscious, you, uh, and, and actually the subconscious actually uh, consists of multiple sub-regions. It's not simply one uh, state. It doesn't have only one state. The subconscious can have many, many uh, sub-states. So um, that's why you know when we look at uh the the brain overall we realize that there are many many not only regions but many many um combinations that all together uh, provide um the interfaces the uh um, the complex interactions between uh the regions and, and the layers and all of those interactions um are based on the individual states in the regions and the overall brain so each region or multiple regions can have uh, states. Um, most of them have distinct states, 
uh, the overall brain slash mind can have its own state. And we, you know, the person that we are, will realize what our uh, mental state is when we're conscious. So um, that's kind of the idea around what awareness is, is that we're aware of what's happening in us and around us. We're aware of being, of existing, and the things around us. Also, another aspect to, to understand is that these multiple regions and layers within the brain um, pretty much always, they can do uh, either or both of either cooperate or compete or do both um, against other regions in the brain. And this is uh, one of the things that makes it much more dynamic, much more difficult to understand. And oftentimes when we're talking about regions that are not associated with consciousness or awareness, uh, it's very difficult to communicate with and, and ask the person, you know, how do you feel? I mean, they might have access to it if their awareness has is in, in touch with uh, those regions. But oftentimes there are many regions, especially in the subconscious, that we're not aware of. Uh, you know, we're not aware of because our awareness centers are not in communication with those regions. Um, Excuse and, me, Sanjay. So, what's that? Sanjay, if I, if I can, uh, there's some distortion with the slides themselves. Uh, part of it is being covered. This has happened before. Uh, so I don't know if you want to stop sharing and reshare. Do you see the distortion? There it is. I don't see any. I'm not sure. I mean, is it the, um, the pop up? Kind of covered. Yeah, it's kind of covered. Uh, is it is is it changed? Uh, yeah. Now it's on the bottom. I, I don't know if that's okay. going to interfere with the, the reading of your slides. Uh, Wait, so. Well, that I think what's. I mean, yeah. I don't know how to solve this because that's the, the bar in Zoom that pops up, the control bar. I'm not sure if I can remove that. Uh, you you might, go to maybe full screen. I am in full screen. Yeah. Uh, um. This had been a problem in the past, but we had been able to correct it. Uh, seeing if there's any wanna, option that lets me. Do you want to stop sharing and share again? Sure. Let me let me try that. All right. Does that change anything? No, it actually created more. So okay, I, there, I don't there think it's just. Yeah, there. Uh, I'll try to move it as far as I can off. Well, I don't know if I can do that. I wish there was a way for me to move. It's it's kind of stuck. It locks it's up. It's interesting it because it doesn't seem to be, there were parts at the top that were actually covered. Anyway, um, we can work with it. So now the whole thing is. Yeah, I'll have to move it. I mean, it's. I don't know how to make it. I can't make it smaller. I can't um, disable. It's OK. I think we can work with this. Uh, go and until, well, yeah, not, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's with the control panel. That's a part of the share screen. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, that's, that's what, what, to me, I can't see what's being blocked, but that's on my screen, which I imagine probably it isn't showing you the control panel, but it's hiding whatever's underneath the control panel. All right. All right. So, um, I'll try to move it when, if I can, um, sorry about that, everyone. Um, we'll try to work on that. Uh, see if we can change that in Zoom somehow. Uh, all right. So, so basically, the so I, hopefully everything's readable at this point. Jo it, it, it is. Okay. All right. I, I moved it. Time. I moved it all the way to the bottom, but I'll have to rearrange it later as I expand the the slide. So, um, so there are regions that cooperate and compete against each other, um, and these cooperations and competitions are actually what form the the dynamic nature of, of our behavior. Um, for example, a lot of times when um, you know we are uh, are doing something and we're not aware of it, it may be that that a, um, uh, a subconscious part of our subconscious memory, let's say, um, from our past, um, arises in our subconscious region, which we would not be aware of. But that subconscious memory, depending on the power it has over us, depending on either the emotional nature or the strength of that memory or or the context of how it fits into what you're doing at that moment. You know, um, that memory may cause interference with what you're doing. It may um, change your emotional state. For example, if it's a negative memory, it probably will change your emotional state. But you might not realize that you're having that memory because it's not in your awareness. And in some cases, when that memory is so strong, not only will it change your emotional state, but then it might actually 
come into your awareness and then you'll understand why your emotional state changed. So these are some of the dynamics around um, the regions and how each of them can have their own state. So if the subconscious region changes state to a negative state, but that information does not get transmitted to our awareness center, then it would affect our mood, but we won't understand why, or we might not even realize. I mean, we might feel a little bit of a change in our mood, but we might not fully grasp why that happened. We might not be aware that there's a memory that's playing in our subconscious at that moment that is affecting us. And over time, it might actually emerge into our consciousness or into our awareness center. So, so these are some of the issues that come up. And, and the example I gave is actually around competition, but the same thing can happen with cooperation where something that emerges in our memory or, or in a different region of the, of the brain, not necessarily memory, that can uh, reinforce something that is existing. So for example, if you're playing sports, there may be um, memories uh, of your uh, proprioceptory um, centers, which help you to control your body very well. So let's say you're playing tennis and, and, some, and if you're a, a, a player who used to play tennis many, many years ago, but you haven't for a little while, um, if you come back to it, just similar to, similar to riding a bicycle, if you come back to it, um, after a few minutes of, of practice, you know, after many years of loss, um, after a few minutes of practice, your brain and, and actually the uh, cerebellum, which encodes a lot of that information about motion, um, will start to reactivate and it will start to send information, um, which you won't be aware of because the cerebellum is really not a part of our consciousness. It's a part of our movement. Dancers um, sometimes become aware of this. They, they sometimes feel like they're in the flow, and that's a sense of it's not a direct communication, but that's a sensation that people can have where their body is acting more uh, in line with what they want it to do. Um, and, and that's an example where the information out of the cerebellum is actually reaching other parts of the brain because the movement actually has to go through our, our cortex. Movement doesn't happen directly from the cerebellum. It has to go through the cortex. So the cortex has to become aware at some level. Um, of those memories from the cerebellum. So again, these are very, very complicated ideas I'm trying to raise, and I'm trying to do them in a simple way using examples that, that would be relatable to most people. So um, again, cooperation and competition, these are they're very important elements. These are some of the fundamental things that happen in our brain that a lot of people don't really even realize. So, um, so I wanted to present that early just so that, you know, um, if anyone has questions or, or in the discussion, you want to raise that, um, that's, that's an important topic to try to understand. Now, the purpose of all of this, um, of, of our mental states especially, um, is to for us, for the person, to determine what they will do, what they will focus on. And I put the word focus in quotes because oftentimes the person may not realize that they're doing something because those motivations, those desires, the brain states may actually emerge from the subconscious. So, for example, if you find yourself, um, let's say you're walking in your neighborhood, and you find yourself that you, you know you kind of get lost in your memories and you're thinking about other things, but your body and your mind it continues walking along a path. And the reason is because even though your conscious mind is not aware of the path that you're taking, the route that you're walking on, um, a part of your brain in your subconscious is aware. So that's why the word focus is in quotes because it's not your attention center that's focusing, but another part of your brain that's doing the focusing for you in that instance. So that can happen here. Our focus doesn't have to remain with our attention center all the time. Um, this is a lot of time. These, these really create the more complex types of behaviors where, um, you know, you know some, sometimes even confusion can, can um, involve uh, doing things that you're aware of based on, on our memories. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, so, so anyway, th these are all um, uh, aspects to, uh, uh, attention and, and our, our mental states. So, uh, and, and the last point on the slide, which uh, um, hopefully it's visible at the bottom, is attention mediates our intention. Now, intention is that part of our brain which is really dealing with what we want to do, which we have an, uh, a desire to do, and um, that we believe we are doing or we will do. So that's the attention center of our brain, which uh, which mediates in intention. But if that attention is not in the attention center, if it's, let's say, in a subconscious or if it's in, let's say, uh, the cerebellum, for example, for, for example, a tennis player or a dancer, um, they're not thinking about every movement. But they're the, these other parts of the brain 
um, controls their body and causes them in a sense. So when a dance is, is, is performed uh, beautifully, you know, correctly, the way that the performer wants it to happen, or if a sports player, um, you know, if a tennis player moves the racket in such a way that, that, they were, that they, they, the stroke returns the ball exactly where they want it to go, um, they're not really thinking about it. None of these things are happening through thought or ideation or, or even emotions. It, they seem to be automatic, but they're really not automatic. What, the point here is that there are focus centers in the brain, which in this, in the example of a dancer or a tennis player, they are um, what we might call, uh, you know, subconscious. Um, they are not in our awareness. They are not in our consciousness. Although the, the fact that you are moving is in your consciousness, but the actual control that you exercise over all of your emotions and all of your muscles, they are not in our conscious mind. We are not thinking about the specific muscles we want to move in each instance. So the simple notion of moving and dancing or playing, playing tennis is in our attention, but exactly the details of what we're doing when we're playing tennis or dancing would not be in our attention. So again, this, this is um, some of the complexity around this, but overall attention, whether it's in our attention seeking region or whether it's below, it always mediates our intention. So that's, that's another last important point. So here's, here's a slide that gets into some, and this is very rough in terms of the functions of what we're able to do. Um, we, uh, on the left side, these are things that we recognize. These are mainly visual, part of the visual cortex. Um, places, faces, color, many, many other things, but these are the simplest things that uh, we recognize. Um, on the right side, these are they're, they're more um, uh, complicated and, and uh, unified concepts. Uh, for example, uh, language. Language is not a simple, simple one co single construct. It actually encompasses uh, many things. So um, grasping, so at the top are, are basically the physical aspects, um, uh, spatial and physical aspects of our body. And the bottom are more um, psychological aspects and language, uh, communication, uh, cognition, um, these, these aspects. So these are all the, um, examples of functional, um, and you might say regions, but some of these things are not distinctly one region. They, they actually overlap across multiple regions. So we can think of them as, as compound regions or regional clusters. Um, so when I say, the, when, I, when we refer to region, it doesn't have to be a single region. It can be a cluster of regions also that um, work together. And that cluster, that cluster uh, may communicate with a different cluster or it may communicate with a different single region. So the communication uh, between uh, areas of the brain can become really, really uh, complicated. This is a different slide that goes into another way of looking at functional areas of the brain. Um, this splits up the lobes, but also it goes into the cerebellum, which I described earlier, the brain stem. These are also very important parts of our, our brain. Um, the motor cortex, which uh, you know, this last slide referred to, and the description of, of tennis and, and dancing um, is driven by the motor cortex, but also it's driven by the cerebellum, both of these things, because coordination is, is a part of the cerebellum, although movement is embedded within coordination. And movement is the part of our cortex, which is really responsible for actually controlling um, each individual muscle. Um, the cerebellum doesn't have direct access to that. Um, uh, although um, the brain stem, to some extent, like for example, our respiratory, uh, our breathing status, that it actually does have some access. So it's not always that the motor cortex is the only thing that accesses our muscles. Um, most of our muscles are through that. So a lot of these, so Broca's area on the left here, speech, um, the, you know, or, or the next area, is actually that's on the bottom right. So the, these are all areas that are very, dis some, many of these are distinct areas which have been known for, for uh, close to two centuries. Other areas um, actually have our understanding of them have evolved over time and, and they're not as distinct as they were originally. They're, they're actually more uh, profuse across multiple areas of the brain and even sometimes across both hemispheres. So um, this slide gets more into the structure, excuse me, into the structure and the, um, the physical form of, of, of the brain. And one thing that many of you would be aware of the four lobes that we often refer to, and there's actually a fifth lobe, the limbic lobe. It's usually not referred to as lobe. Um, it's usually referred to as a limbic system, but we can think of it as a lobe. It, it, there's no reason why you can't. But so all of these are more physical structures of the brain, um, although they do have some corresponding uh, uh, functional attributes. For example, occipital lobe, lobe um, in the rear is primarily responsible for vision, um, although it's 
uh, it actually extends into many of the other lobes. There are actually these sharp distinctions that you see on these diagrams are not as clear in the real world. The parietal lobe and the occipital lobe actually merge together. So, one and the parietal lobe, one of the things it does, it has, it gives us the sensation of um, of space, of what's around us in space. And when we see things, this is the reason why our visual system, um, because we see in three dimensions, three dimensions automatically encodes things in space for us. So when we see objects and our brain recognizes at some level that one object is in front of another level, that's because the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe are merging, are, are behaving cooperatively together to give us that sensation of 3D um, object placement in, in uh, the field, visual field around in front of us. Um, our, those two lobes work very tightly together to do that. Similarly, the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe, oftentimes they work together whenever we're watching a movie, for example, something that has video and audio at the same time. They work together. Um, and uh, for people who have hearing impairments, um, that's one of the reasons why they're able to use their eyes and they're, they're, they're able to uh, uh, read lips of people because the in visual information that they get from their eyes, from the occipital lobe, easily gets transferred to the temporal lobe where the listening, the language comprehension part of it occurs. And it's because it's, it's, they're so tightly integrated, um, that's very easy for us to do. So as a person gradually loses the ability to hear, they oftentimes don't even realize that they're losing the ability and they don't realize that they're using their, their eyes to listen to what the other person is saying. Only when the other person's lips have become covered, do they realize, oh, I'm not able to understand anymore. And then they realize something's right. Although, what in using that example, what usually happens at the beginning because they're not aware that they're losing their, their hearing. What usually happens is they get confused. They get confused about why they're not able to hear all of a sudden. They don't understand that it's because the other person's lips have been covered. They don't make that connection. So again, because of the information that's flowing between different regions of the brain, and if we're aware of different aspects or not, that can lead to different states. So for example, the state of confusion where someone is losing their hearing but doesn't realize that yet, that's a complex phenomenon um, driven by the sharing of information, the cooperation between the occipital temporal lobe, the fact that their awareness is aware that they're watching a movie and they're listening and understanding that they have awareness of the dialogue that's happening in front of them. But there's a dissonance and there's a disconnect between the realization and you might say awareness that because the lips of the person speaking got became covered, they lost temporarily the ability to understand that person because they're not realizing they're actually understanding them using their eyes, not their ears. So that's that's one of the complex, um, not very, but it's a little bit compli complicated scenario where a person would, um, where all of these different brain states work together to give them an understanding of what's happening in front of them, or even to give them confusion, not realizing what's, what's happening in front of them. So, um, and then this is a simple uh, diagram that shows multiple regions, and uh, as I described earlier, the region cluster, um, where they can communicate together. Information flows uh, from one to the next, and oftentimes the information flows from one to multiple. So region two communicates with all of the other three regions list shown on the diagram, and, and others also, whereas um, region two only communicate, or sorry, region one only communicates with region two directly, and then with uh, two others which are not identified here. So um, the con the communication within the brain um, is very complicated and um, and that is is uh, what would really, the, the state information within each region so each of these regions would have its own state information and then the overall brain the overall person um, would have an awareness of what's happening where they are you know you might say the context of realization of, of the world that they're in at the time um, and that would be in what's known as the awareness center of the brain and that would have a connection with the consciousness regions of the brain, um, which would be another. Uh, so it might be that these two um, gray regions of the, in the front, uh, you know, the left side of the, the diagram, which corresponds to the frontal lobe, these two might correspond to the, um, the consciousness. Well, one of the reasons where consciousness exists because it exists in multiple regions, one of the primary regions where it, ex where it exists, and the other one might correspond to the attention center where we have awareness and we have attention of what we're doing, of what's happening around us. And also, um, this attention center has awareness of what's happening inside of the brain. Um, not always. Sometimes it, it has a direct link. But for example, this, this uh, um, uh, region at the bottom here, which is not identified, it is not directly connected to that attention center. Um, so in this case, it 
there is no direct connection. Although physically there would be connection, but in this example, that connection is not active. So the attachment center would not be aware of what's happening in this lower region here. Um, but Or it might be that this lower region um, sends its information to region one and region four. And through region one and four, this attention center might get a glimpse of what's happening in this other region. So this, this is another layer of the complexity of how information can flow. That information can flow through intermediate regions, but then that information flowing through the intermediate regions would actually be, it could be distorted, it could be warped, it can be changed, it can be attenuated or lessened. You know, the strength of that information may be lessened. So for example, if this, if this lower region is, is a region that encodes, it might be the emotional center, because in terms of the locality, this corresponds to some of the limbic regions. So if this is encoding, let's say, fear, um, and this person is not aware that they're, they're, they're feeling a sense of anxiety. What might happen is this region one and region four. So region one, one might be, um, the region that encodes, um, uh, language. And so the, I mean, you know, physically, the, in terms of the, the um, structural location that corresponds and region four might, might actually be pain. So what might happen is that the attention center of the brain might get a sensation of stronger pain and the language processing may be warped in a sense because this person has fear and anxiety that's bubbling underneath them that they're not aware of at the time, but it's there. And it's changing their perception of pain because I, when you have anxiety, when you have any kind of stress, pain sensation can increase. And so these are just examples of how something that's latent and not aware in us um, can actually affect other aspects of our understanding of ourselves, um, as well as understanding of the, of the outside world. I mean, it can change how we perceive things. So um, next, let's go into attention a little bit. Um, attention is, um, so actually before, the, these are just two quotes which I think should help us to understand why attention is so important. So um, Amishi Jha is, is a researcher in, neuro, in neuroscience. She um, has done a lot of uh, uh, studies in these areas um, as well as related areas. Um, and two, two quotes that she says, um, one of the videos that I linked to is, is where these quotes come from, so you can actually um, hear the context around what she's saying this in. Um, but attention is the leader of the brain. That's one of the things that she says, and, and it, it seems to be very much true. I believe that that's true. I mean, in my understanding of this, um, and, and a lot of the research shows this to be true. Um, the second point that she made is where attention goes, the rest of the brain follows. Um, and what that means is that the attention is basically uh, driving us to do the things that we want to do. And, and in one of the earlier slides where I said that attention mediates intention, this, the, these both um, um, phrases um, are, are encapsulated in that, in that other phrase, attention mediates intention. Um, so attention is, is very important in terms of what the brain is trying to do, what the brain is wanting to do. Um, the next quote um, is not by a researcher, but uh, she wrote a book um, in the area, but um, she has a background in uh, organizational um, uh, behavior. Um, and what she said is attention is a mechanism through which the brain focuses its resources. And actually there's a similar point that, that um, I Amishi mean, Jha also mentioned, but that, that is that our brain is really the organ. And this is something I've raised many times in, in past uh, discussions was that the brain is one of the main organs that manages our, our uh, energy. It manages how effectively we operate in the world because one of the main things that it needs to do that it does do is it figures out how to get things done with minimal energy. For example, we use energy to move our body. So perhaps it might find the path of motion for us, running, walking, swimming, whatever it is, um, jumping. But whatever the, the minimum path of motion is you know, through the physical world for us to move through, um, it will uh, inherently do that. It also will um, do that in terms of the, um, let's say, the shortest amount of time, because the more time that it takes for something to happen, the more energy generally it takes our body. Our body needs to ex uh, expend more energy uh, per unit time. So that is another aspect. So all of these aspects of energy management is one of the fundamental things that our brain does. And that's why um, animals which are efficient in managing their energy um, have better survival, have better longevity, 
they have um, um, they, they their lives are better uh, in control because energy um, and, and resources is one type. Resources is the broader sense of that. Energy is just one type, but energy is the most important. So all resources are what the brain um, tries to uh, maximize its capabilities in and tries to maximize how it can effectively use every aspect of us uh, to do what it needs to, what, what we want to do. And attention is that mechanism, which is, um, you know, as Amishi Shah says, the leader of, of our ability to, um, to uh, rally the forces, um, rally all of our, our, our abilities um, to do what we want to do. So these, these two um, quotes should give us an understanding why attention is the, the main thing that I'm focusing on tonight, but why it is, it is uh, so important in uh, neurosciences. There actually were other, other um, um, information that I was going to post in the media, which I didn't. Some of them were very long. I'm not sure if my, my sense is that people typically don't like watching long videos, but if people don't mind that in future talks, I will post them because many of these are, are for example, courses. Um, university courses, they might be an hour or an hour, an hour and a half long, which many people don't have time to, to go through. But if I do post those in the future, if people have interest, um, you know, all of the videos, all of the information that posted are optional, but those I would list under, um, you know, a different category, just to let you know that, that if you want to delve further into a topic, um, those might help you. Um, what, what I usually, I haven't done that in the past. I haven't given any information that takes too much time to, to go through. But if there is interest, if people want to go into more detail, for example, this topic attention is vital to a lot of the things that we will talk about um, in the future, especially because it is central to consciousness. So that might be something that, that I can post if you're interested. So attention is necessary to function to basically everything that we do. Attention is necessary. And what that means is not and, and the word attention here is not necessarily um, referring to the attention center of our brain. We don't have to have an awareness that we are um, of, of what we're attentive to. That attention, as I described earlier, may be below our consciousness. It may be subconscious, and that's fine. But we always have to, some part of our brain always has to have an understanding of what it wants to do and whether it's doing it or not. You know, for example, if it, of setting a goal and whether it's able to uh, make progress along reaching that goal or not. So for example, when we're engrossed in a daydream, but yet we're walking along the sidewalks, you know, our brain is capable enough, our subconscious regions are capable enough not to have us wander off into a road where a car might hit us. Our subconscious is capable enough to keep us on the sidewalk only while we're daydreaming and not even aware really of what where we're walking. And that happens all the time. Similarly, when we're driving, a lot of times, if it's a route that you're very, very comfortable with and familiar with, you probably are not thinking about where to turn, where to go, what to do, the driving is almost automatic. I mean, as close to automatic as it can be, um, where you really don't have to think about any of it. Um, unless something unusual happens, the, the driving and the walking, um, in the other example, is, is pretty much automatic. Um, so that's an example where there is attention, but the attention is not in our attention center, what we think of as our consciousness. Um, so that's important. So the attention helps us to focus on, on tasks that are important to us. And again, us might be in that moment, it might be the subconscious person who wants to do something subconsciously, not necessarily aware of, of, of that. It also helps us to maintain a context of where we are in the world, what we're doing in the world, what's occurring around us. This context is very important. And this context is actually what is critical to us functioning but also it's critical to us not being confused because sometimes when we lose, when we lose awareness of things around us, it can cause confusion. Um, and we're going to go to that in a, in a few minutes, but, um, um, so context is, is a very important part of us, um, functioning uh, appropriately because when we have awareness of the world around us and how we fit into that world, what's happening, for example, after you wake up from, from sleep, from a very, uh, deep sleep. Um, we are groggy, but the grogginess is actually an aspect of us not having a full context of where we are. We, we just woke up. We might have a realization that we were asleep. We might have a realization that we're lying in some bed. We might not realize, is it a hotel room? Is it my own bed? Um, you might not realize where it is. And so that context over a few seconds and sometimes a minute or two 
uh, takes time to come back into our awareness um, where we realize, oh, this is exactly where I am. This is what happened. And this is the situation. I fell asleep at night. Now it's morning. I'm waking up. And today is a weekday or weekend. And these are the things I have to do. So that context um, was lost when we were unconscious, um, at least the context in our in our aware mind, in the awareness area of our mind. Now, that context may have existed in subconscious areas. For example, when we're dreaming, this is one of the reasons why when we're dreaming, we actually have an awareness. Um, some people, especially especially people who have lucid dreams, they have an awareness that they are in the dream or they have an awareness that they're they're uh, asleep and yet they're lucidly dreaming. So context doesn't disappear when we're asleep or when we're unconscious. It can actually remain um, in us. So uh, and the uh, third point here is that attention is variable. Um, the amount of attention and where our attention is, is directed, whether it's inward, whether it's outward, what, and inward it can be into our body, so physically, or inward it can be into our mind. Um, uh, so those are aspects. Also, if it's outward or, or even inward, exactly where is it focused? Um, is it focused in a very rough sense where I'm kind of attentive to that area over there, something's going on? Or is it where you're laser focused and you really are pinpointing and you really, really are understanding exactly what's happening there? You're not just a rough understanding, but you have a very uh, detailed understanding of, of that area. Or do you have a more uh, pervasive, more uh, general understanding of the world around you? Nothing specific, but you have a, an understanding of the scene that's in front of you um, that might happen after you wake out of a sleep. Um, so attention is variable and it can vary under our control or it can vary by external factors. And external factors are, if you, those who watch the videos, there are some examples that were given. Um, for example, if, if um, um, you uh, see something that causes stress in you, um, that external factor and the stress that it induces in us can actually change the level of attention that we have. Um, it can definitely change stress, but it changes many aspects of our attention. Um, our ability to focus, our ability to understand, our ability to comprehend what's happening. Um, it can actually have catastrophic effects um, whereby we lose control of what's happening or we lose the ability to control ourselves with the situation we're in. For example, if you get really confused, um, this happens with pilots a lot of times, where there's situational awareness or in the military, this can happen also, um, not necessarily military fighters, but just even infantry on, on the ground, um, where you are in a, such a complex situation and the information that's available to you is vague. So with pilots flying through a cloud, let's say, they can't rely on their on their eyesight. And that's the reason why commercial pilots, professional pilots need to be trained in uh, what's known as instrument flight rules. So they, they need to rely only, they need to be able to fly only using the instruments and not looking at all outside the cockpit. They need to be able to fly using only the information representation that helps them to understand the context of where this airplane is in space um, how rapidly it's moving, which direction it's moving in, is it under their control or not, um, are they able to control it or not, all of these aspects that a pilot is dealing with, um, if they uh, get stressed, and this happens all the time, this is one of the reasons why a lot of the policies around piloting an FAA and airlines, how airlines operate, they limit the number of hours that pilots can fly, because if they get into a certain mental state where um, the stress can overcome or overwhelm their uh, systems, then they can more easily, much more easily and much more quickly get into a state of confusion or get into a state of panic or get into a state of a situation where they lose the ability to have attention and focus and control the things around them. Therefore, they, they literally can lose the ability to control the airplane leading to, uh, to negative outcomes. So attention is very variable. And it's easily varied by things around us, outside of us. Um, so these are important concepts to understand. Um, there's a, okay, I'm not sure what happened there. So attention can easily be subverted by uh, many things outside of us. Um, uh, it, our our um, attention can be divided uh, by too many stimuli, um, either internal or external. Um, uh, and, and this is one of the, so earlier examples that I gave where, uh, you have subconscious regions in the brain that are sending information all across different regions of the brain, including to the attention uh, center of the brain. So if there, there's too much information going to the attention center of the brain, um, that attention center can be overloaded. 
um, its attention, in a sense, can be divided across 20 different situations internal to our mind that's happening at the time. Um, and we lose the ability to understand or we have a, a reduced functional understanding of what's happening in, in, in our brain. So that's an example where um, uh, our attention can be divided. Another example where our attention can be divided is uh, not simply that, that we have too many things going on. It might be that we have only a few things, one or two things going on. But one of those things is so, in terms of the energy, in terms of the emotional energy involved, it is so powerful for us. For example, it might be that, that uh, you know, we're, we're watching a movie and in the movie, there's a scene that reminds us of something from our past. And if that scene reminds us of something that's either very positive or very negative or very emotional, you know, um, that um, the strength of those emotions may overtake everything else that we're experiencing at that moment. It may cause us, it may, it may cause our attention to basically uh, take on the nature of that strongly emotional uh, aspect. So if it's something that really, um, um, you know, was touching, um, you know, uh, sentimental, it may actually cause us to physically start to cry. And, you know, uh, we know that when we watch movies like that, we literally can begin to cry. And this is the reason why that happens because um, the, and this is where the people who made the movie, the director especially, do it intentionally. They create a scene which is understandable by many people. It might be a scene which is uh, um, part of the human uh, diaspora. You know, many people have had this type of emotion, emotion in, in their lives. It might be around um, something to do with your child or your parent, something that, that usually tend to be emotional. Um, and and the scene, watching that scene will bring out similar emotions in the viewer, in you. And if those emotions are strong enough in you, they will cause a reaction in you. So what, what actually happens is that that emotion that's coming out, that the movie is bringing out in you, um, overtakes all of the other regions of the brain, all of the other states of the brain, and it basically dominates your mental state at the moment, making you cry. So that's an example where the tension is divided not by too many states, but it might be one state that is extremely powerful, extremely emotionally powerful, and it dominates and takes over attention. Um, so these are there are, are examples. Um, the um, let me try to move the this so that uh, you can see the bottom. So uh, multitasking is, is another part of attention that that's important to understand. And many people, you know, over the years we've heard about multitasking. Uh, so it's a myth that multitasking helps our attention or that we can do multiple things at the same time. All of the research so far has shown, pretty much all of the research has shown that humans and animals for that matter, um, most animals that we looked at are not able to multitask effectively. We might feel as if we are effective at multitasking, but that's a false perception. Um, it's actually not only a false perception, it's actually a false um, uh, construct that our brain creates. One of the things that I've tried to um, uh, present in, in prior talks is that there are certain types of things which our brain creates artificially, um, yet they sometimes can be false. So our brain can create false notions sometimes. And sometimes these are intentional. These are helpful to us because what they actually do is they simplify something that's extremely complicated, but it prevents a falsified, simplified version of it to us, which helps us to function and to, and to interact with it. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, our, when our brain falsifies or, or simplifies things, it's not always bad. But in the case of multitasking, it, it usually is because we have mo many people have this notion that they are successful at multitasking when we're really not. Um, all, all the studies in, in people have, have found that we um, our performance degrades uh, substantially between 10 and 30 percent on average, and in some cases even worse um, when we're multitasking. And it depends on the number of things you're multitasking with. It depends on how quickly you're switching back and forth. Um, it depends on your familiarity with each of the tasks you're involved in. Um, many things that can that can um, that compound work together to affect effectiveness um, during multitasking. But it's definitely a myth. We are not able to multitask. And um, what we know of is that our optimal performance occurs when we use attention to focus on a single thing. When we're focusing, when our attention is focused, um, and especially if our cognitive attention, meaning our attention of our um, attention center. So you might say the conscious attention is focused. That's the best situation where um, you're really doing uh, the best that you can. And this is an example where, um, uh, you know, 
in the, in the pre previous slide where I had some quotes. Um, these are examples where, excuse me, where we are trying to, where our brain is trying to um, uh, optimize and maximize our ability in doing something. Um, this is the reason why we have optimal performance in that because attention um, brings in all of the resources that our brain has access to um, from memory, from past experiences, uh, training, habits, um, to our physical state of our body at that moment. Um, if it requires any kind of physical activity, um, it can be, um, for example, if it's something to do with, uh, so for example, we're talking about uh, sports or, or dancing, um, then it allows us to focus to the most minute details of how to control our body, not using our thoughts, not using um, the idea that I'm going to move this leg in this way and this arm in this way. We don't do it at that level, but that level that is uh, handled automatically subconsciously, um, but it's all choreographed together um, using our brain, which is focused on the act of dancing. And, and we have awareness of what the dance is, what the moves are, what we're supposed to do each second of the dance. These are things that are in our memory, but it almost directly goes from the memory to the muscle centers. It doesn't have to go through our cognitive thought processes. It directly goes from, oh, I, I know how to do this dance. Next comes a twirl and automatically your body begins to do the twirl without you even realizing that you be, began doing that. That's optimal performance because our focus is, is you might say, laser focused on um, doing everything um, to the level that our uh, mind has been trained to do, that, that we want to do, and that the goal that we have at that moment of performing this dance in the best way or, or playing tennis in the best way we can, um, you know, if that to meet that goal. So attention, um, all of these aspects of attention uh, are very important. Um, also attention, so just a, a rough um, uh, rundown. Multiple regions communicate with each other. They communicate with our attention center and they communicate with our consciousness, quote unquote, consciousness center. Um, an attention center is often dominant and active while we are conscious, but not always. Um, um, it is prone to overload by both internal and external stimuli. Um, there is a phenomenon I didn't describe, but um, in the write up, I briefly mentioned uh, time of flight, which basically we, there's something called mental time travel, which we are capable of doing. Um, humans are animals, some higher level animals also are capable of doing this, but humans especially, um, where we can uh, go back in time into the past and recollect something and actually almost relive an experience that happened in the past. And it doesn't actually have to be where we're referencing something that actually happened. We can actually go back in the past and we can imagine something in the past which we were not a part of. We can imagine, let's say, at the time of, of, uh, of Caesar or the time of of the dinosaurs, where we definitely weren't alive, we can imagine uh, a situation happening at that time. So time of flight lets us do this. Um, and this is uh, one of the things that's mediated by the attention centers in the brain. And, and again, not just past, also uh, the future. We can also go into the future. We can imagine what might happen. Um, but now this time of flight actually is one of the things that causes a lot of the difficulty and problems in us because um, a lot of what we do um, and I think one of the videos that I linked to actually referenced um, the, the three types of time of flight, um, going to the past, staying in the present, and going to the future. And there have been studies that I found. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, stick to the numbers absolutely because these numbers probably will change over time. But the one study that this researcher found, uh, cited uh, said that about 12% of the time that we uh, spend uh, that, that we are uh, attentive to, that we are focused on attention, that we have attention on, um, is in the past. Um, I think it was around 28% is in the present and 48% is in the future. So pretty much half of our time is in the future. Um, and all three of these don't add up to 100 because there's a, a, around 12% left, which is actually not related to time at all. That a little more complicated. We won't get into that. But basically, a lot of our, our time of flight activity is in the future. And if you understand this, if you believe this, this may help explain why a lot of the um, negative aspects to uh, to um, attention. For example, whenever we are uh, we get engrossed in thought, whenever we're busy doing something, and let's say it becomes boring, or or, or you know we get tired of something, and we start to daydream, we start to wander, 
what happens is when our mind is wandering, when you've lost attention, it's going usually 48% of the time, this, this study found, into the future. And the reason why is because the future, a lot of future um, uh, wandering has to do with catastrophizing, it has to do with rumination, it has to do with a lot of um, worrying, anxiety. Anxiety is basically fear. Um, and it, it is, it's based on these latent fears that we all have in us, which is again in our subconscious. And when they, they don't necessarily come out into our awareness, what happens is when we're busy or when we're bored, for example, when we're low on attention, what happens is these regions of the brain, for example, of memories of fearful things or things that you're worried about. Um, you know, you have a test exam examination coming up and you're worried that you might uh, do poorly in it, that you're not prepared. So what might happen is that uh, you're thinking about, about something totally different um, and you get engrossed in it. And that fear that's latent about an exam that's coming up, maybe it's a, a week away. That fear is in you. You're not aware of it, but that fear is driving a lot of things in you. And so when you start to go into a time of flight and when you start to imagine and let's say daydream, the daydream immediately goes to the future of when this exam happens. Um, and you might have negative thoughts around that negative um, uh, constructed reality. You know, you're, you're creating a version of reality which doesn't exist, which you're projecting, which you're imagining. Um, that you might fail the exam or something might happen or, or you know, whatever. Um, so that's an example uh, where um, attention is, is central to this and often has because a lot of that happens in, in the future. Um, that's one of the reasons why a lot of our behavior is, uh, a lot of our behavior can be so limiting because we are afraid of what might happen in the future. So this is one of the reasons why um, it's believed that um, uh, roughly half of our um, uh, uh, rumination or, or um, uh, catastrophization is is uh, in the future, not the past. Okay, um, and consciousness can be used to control our attention. Um, it can be, it doesn't have to be. And consciousness can be subverted um, when other regions override, for example, uh, such a thing as fugue states. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but um, it's another complex area. So just overall, to summarize these things in terms of, of how we can operate better in the world, if we understand these aspects, um, attention is vital. Um, um, and these three things, um, uh, one of the, the videos she actually described this. So, so, um, um, but, but this, this, uh, I think, um, enunciates this pretty, pretty succinctly. So attention is vital. Attention is very important in doing what we want to do in staying focused on what we want to do. Um, practice is also important. Practice was actually d discussed. Uh, as an aspect of mindfulness by uh, by um, Amishi Jha in her presentation. Um, it wasn't covered in any of the other uh, topics, but practice and mindfulness together go hand in hand. Um, but mindfulness specific to practicing attention. So if you can practice the type of attention that you can exert on your world um, and not have, for example, your smartphone interact and in, in, interrupt you or not being distracted by things, so the practice of mindfulness especially, but practicing in general, practicing anything in general, will help you to operate and be successful in the world. But practicing your mindfulness, and in particular, practicing mindfulness around your attention and control of your attention. This is vital this, to, to being successful in the world. And the last is passion. Basically, interest in arousal, one, one of the, the videos that I presented um, went into, um, uh, there's a Yorke um, Garban, um, graph that, that he showed. Um, and, and that basically has to do with interest slash arousal slash attention and the level of attention arousal that we have. If it's too low or if it's too high, it actually causes a problem in, in how successful or how um, uh, in our performance. And only if it's in the sweet spot in the center, if it's strong enough but not too strong, um, are we successful in, in performing whatever we want to do. So passion is one of those aspects also that if we're interested in the subject but not overwhelmed by it, not um, you know uh, infatuated by it, and, or we don't have any interest in it, if it's somewhere uh, you know, in, in, in the sweet spot, then that will also act to excuse me, our ability to succeed. Um, let's, so quickly, we're just going to go through the confusion, not too much on this because this is, I think most people understand what it is, but um, we're going to, um, oh, that. Okay, so um, here's a short video which um, uh, is going to 
show a little bit of confusion. This is this was a senator from a while back. He's he's been retired for a few years, but this is something that that you'll recognize as soon as it happens. Um, yep, on our way. All right, this is just replay. So he basically he's he's reading something on the desk, and he thinks that he's wearing glasses, and he tries to take his eyeglasses off, but then he realizes he doesn't have eyeglasses on, um, and he's confused. Um, and you can kind of see some of these after he realizes. You can see in his facial expression um, some emotions which we generally characterize as negative emotions. Um, so let me um, show one of these. So this is one of the first emotions that pops up on his face. And if you see his lips are slightly wide open, his eyes are glancing down. Um, and in the frame before, his eyes were actually looking forward onto the desk. Right now, they're almost closed. They're not closed, but they're they they, they lowered. They they drooped. So that's that's an aspect of a negative characteristic, um, and his overall it, you can see the wrinkle in his forehead uh, appear a little bit. Th this is an example where uh, he's heading into a negative emotional state, and then this is a, just a, a microsecond later, and these are micro expressions that that you know are, are the term is micro expression. Here the, his lips are much more further apart, his eyes are not as droopy. So he's now he's already realized. So the first first this like this is actually around confusion, right? And this next one is around realization, where now he's realized that he's confused. So automatically his eyes open a little bit. So, he's, he, so once you realize you're confused, you become less confused because you have context of confusion. You're aware that you're confused. Therefore, the confusion starts to disappear. So at this point, his eyes have opened slightly more. So he's having a little less confusion, but his mouth has opened a little more also, which kind of refers to a shock that, wow, how could I do this? I'm not wearing glasses, but I'm, you know, and, and in this context, he's realizing he's sitting in Congress in the Senate. There are probably hundreds of people around who saw him do this. And so he's realizing and he might be embarrassed. So, but the embarrassment doesn't appear on his face yet. We're not going to go into extreme detail, but basically this is just showing what happens when we get confused. And then this is a few, maybe half a second later, where this is disappointment. And this might actually be the beginning of shame, where he starts to feel embarrassed about what happened. Um, and you can clearly see from his face that he's disappointed in, in what, what he did. He forgot that he wasn't wearing glasses. And now this is not something unusual. This happens to everybody. This, this has nothing to do with this, um, age or, or any other aspect. Everybody gets into this situation where we get confused sometimes. And the example I gave with pilots, it can actually happen if they're sleep deprived. Um, this is the reason why a lot of our regulations around uh, piloting are, are so strict, because we don't want pilots to be sleep deprived. We don't want them to get confused. So. Um, I don't want anyone to, to take this example as having to do with age. This is, this is something that was easily visible. Um, it was, I could find a, an example to show using this, but this is not about age. This confusion can happen to anyone at any age. Um, it happens to uh, actually uh, children also. So let me stop here. Um, um, I, there, there's one, one other example that I want to give with, um, uh, with, uh, um, it's not specific to confusion, but basically tying all of these ideas together. Um, and and it's, a, a, it's an example that I'll describe. And that is that if you think about the brain as a jar, okay, a simple jar, or it can be a container or whatever, but a jar because it's see-through, right? Um, a, a glass jar that's see-through. Um, and if you think about, um, if you fill that jar with sand, that sand is one colored, it's all homogeneous. Um, that sand is basically, you can think of it as a single thought or a single um, type of um, uh, ideation. It might be an emotion. It might be feeling, whatever it is. It's a single entity inside the brain. Now, let's say that you add a second uh, amount of sand in, into that jar, which is a different color. Okay? And that represents a second thought emerging into the brain. Okay? Um, and at that point, initially, the two uh, regions of sand would be distinct and they would be separable. And this is what happens in our brain. When we have a second thought, the thought is distinct and it remains in its own state. And those two can communicate to our attention center of the brain, where the attention center becomes aware of these two thoughts. But over time, either, either over time or using stress. So the example in this jar example is that um, over time, as a jar moves through space and time, as it, you know, because things move in general and our body moves and our mind um, our uh, mental state changes over time. So as the jar moves, or it might be that if you shake the jar, and the shaking corresponds to intense stress, 
that if you add stress into the person, either of those two things will cause these two color sands to mix together. And it'll become more difficult to tell one, one apart from the other. But if it's simply two colors and um, the colors are distinct enough, you can probably get a sense that the general sense of the color that will come out of that will be a combined coloration of these two colors. So one might be red color, the other might be green. And if you combine red and green, you end up with something close to yellow, um, depending on the ratio of the amount of green and red sand. So depending on, on, on that, you might get a sense that there's yellowness. And this is similar to what happens in a ring that the two emotional, the two regions of the brain that have their own brain states. If you think of it in a simple way, as one having emotional state called red and the other having emotional state called green, then if they combine together and go to the emotional attention center of our brain, the emotional attention center of our brain might have a sense of yellowness as being the state of our overall brain. That's a very, very simple example. It might actually not be, it might be something totally different, but in a simple example, this is example, what would happen? So now, if you take that jar and add a third color of sand in it, right, it would be, you know, in the beginning, that third color would still be distinct and it wouldn't be mixed in and you can tell the difference, but over time or over stress, it would get mixed in and it would be more difficult to tell. Now, if you continue doing this, and after the third color adding, you might still get a sense of some net color out of it. But if you continue doing this over and over and you have 10 different colored sands, what you'll realize is that, and this happens with anyone who has experienced painting with, with mixing colors, no matter which colors you start off with, if you mix enough of them together, if you mix, mix more than four or five colors together, you will start to get into the gray area. The color will literally become gray. And, and the darkness of that gray will depend on the individual um, tonality and brightness of the individual pigments that you're mixing, or in this case, sand, but you will get a gray, you'll get a homogeneous gray. And that gray is similar to when we talk about mental fog or confusion. That's in a sense what might happen, you know, that might explain confusion. This is not confusion. Confusion is actually more complicated, but this is a simple version where if you have too many thoughts, the example earlier where I, where I gave were if you have too many, too many regions of the brain, 20 or 30 different regions of the brain, all of them active at the same time, having their own, having their own state, and all of that information going to the attention center of the brain. That attention center brain might not have any cohesive or concrete feeling. It might have a gray, uh, you know, sensation about the state that we're in. It might be like a, that might be what boredom is like, you might say, that we don't have any particular thing that we're um, feeling at the time. So that's an example um, of, you know, where a lot of these uh, um, states in the subregions of the brain they can interact and they coalesce into a unified uh, feeling or a sensation of what it is that we're, the context that we're in. Um, and, and it can get very confusing over time if there are too many things that we're dealing with. So let's, I'm going to stop here. And um, so if there's any initial questions, we can go through those. But what I want to do is just have a discussion with the group about what it is that um, uh, you got out of this. And if there's anything you want to add to or, or you know, discuss, um, we can go into that. So folks, uh, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom if you have any questions for Sanjay. Um, if not, I can get us started. A little bit. Um, DLJ, followed by Madeline. Yeah, hi, thanks mute? for that. I uh, appreciate it. Um, so, so I actually, sorry, because I had to disappear for a second. I missed the, like the very first slide. So mental states. Um, so I'm getting the idea, I think, that confusion and attention would be two examples of mental states. Yes. Can yes. you give me any, and, and then we got the question of whether we should treat those as binary or maybe a continuum. So are there others? I mean, can you give me other words that maybe would fit in between those two or, or extremes of? So, so, um, confusion, so they, they, so one of the things that I didn't describe too much here, um, this is, I think, part of the discussion is that, and, and in the meetup description, I had, I had referenced this. So if you read that, you, you may have picked up on that already, but all of our mental states basically exist along a continuum. Yeah. Um, and uh, it can be that they exist along multiple continuums. You can think of it that way, but, um, having too many continuums makes it more difficult to understand. So the simplest way is if you think of them along this one continuum, of 
con confusion being on one end of it, mm -hmm. total clarity and focus being on the other, uh, not focus, but not focus the way we see it, but a, a pristine type of focus, which I don't know if people can imagine, but it is such immense clarity around everything. I mean, you might think of it as, as a realization, you know, a godlike realization of everything. Oh, it all makes sense now, that type of clarity. That would be on the other extreme. So these two, so complete and total utter confusion about where am I, what's going on? I have no idea. I'm lost. Um, in, almost to the sense where you don't even understand what you're seeing in front of you. Um, and actually with pilots, this can happen uh, where they have to get into such a, a situation. So total confusion on one end, total clarity on the other end. These are two uh, extremes of the continuum. Now, along this continuum, there are many, many things that can happen. And, and I can give you words, but there really aren't, there isn't a set of words that are right or wrong. Basically, any kind of mental state that we can have um, would, would fall somewhere on this continuum. And some of the mental states are in the title of the discussion. So, for example, um, uh, um, you can have uh, being distracted. Okay, so being distracted is more closer to confusion because being distracted basically means that your mind has less attention. So this, this continuum has to do with how much attention you're able to exert at, at that moment. So when you have total clarity, it's because you have maximum attention that you're capable of. When you have confusion, it's because you have no uh, attention. You are totally lost. Attention is totally gone. You don't understand what's going on. You don't have a context of what, where you are, where you are on this, in this world. Are you, uh, for example, if you're, if you're, uh, th there are um, sensory deprivation chambers. Some of you may have heard of that, right? So that's an example where that would give you such an immense, a profound sense of confusion because you lose all sensory input. And this would happen for at least 20, 30 minutes. And after that point, you would not only become confused, but if you stay lo there long enough, it can actually become harmful. If people stay in, in that state for too long, it can become harmful. So that's the other extreme where your attention, there's nothing to attend to. If you're in a sensory deprivation chamber, there's no information. It is completely black. It is completely, there's no temperature sensation. There's no sound. There's no feeling. There's no gravity because usually you're floating. There's no gravity even. There's no sensation literally that your body can pick up on. So you don't know which, which is right side up, which is upside down. It's like floating in, in empty space completely with nothing to see, total blackness. And that would be an example where um, it's profound confusion. You don't know what's up and down. You might not even know if you're alive or not. That's a level that you might reach. So um, this continuum um, is theoretical. Most people are rarely at the either of the extremes. Usually we're somewhere in the middle, more toward, and, and when we're confused, you know, the Orrin Hatch video, he was confused, definitely not completely confused, but he was confused, but he was still aware. He was sitting in the Senate. He became embarrassed because of that. So he was still, he had some awareness. It wasn't like he had zero awareness. Um, so along this continuum, uh, using the the um, uh, the uh, um, exam the the words the five words that I used in the description for this meetup, um, awareness is just attention that that's somewhere in the middle, um, or more toward the side of, of attention. Um, confusion is is toward the one extreme. Daydreaming is probably in the middle, more toward confusion. Distraction is also more toward confusion, and clarity is more toward uh, having maximum awareness. So those words um, are easy to explain, um, but there are you know, almost anything, any situation that we can be in, we can come up with a word to describe it, and that would fall somewhere on this continuum. Mm. So I don't know if I've given you the type of answer you're looking for. Yes. You, uh, no, thank been, you. Yeah. I've been, Sorry, Joe. Do you, mind if we go, do you mind if we go to the next person? I was just going to say, I've got two more it. questions, but let's go to Madeline. But uh, just to plant a seed in your thought, um, I, what I'm hearing you saying is mental state, but also ability to read our mental state. So the awareness of con attention to confusion kind of thing. So we've got multiple yes. layers. So anyway, yes, I'll come back definitely. to that. Yeah. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. So we'll go to Madeline next. Yes, uh, hi Sanjay, thank you. And uh, thanks Joe for hosting. My question is about time of flight, um, our remarkable ability to go both backwards and forwards. And I was wondering about um, its, its evolutionary coming into being. If it's thought that that capability 
began with the, uh, the sort of memory aspect, or if it began more with the forecasting aspect, or if that's not known or not knowable. I mean, obviously the two work in a loop. So over evolutionary time, the, the stronger one got, the stronger the next would get, et cetera, et cetera, over and over again. Um, but I was just wondering if it's known, uh, not quite first, which came first, the chicken or the egg, but almost. <laughs> Yes, um, I am not aware if, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not aware of any um, definitive um, establishing of this. I don't think we can know um, because, again, we, we animals, we beings go back way, way, you know, the dinosaurs were, um, you know, uh, more than 100 million years ago. Um, life began, what, 300 million years ago. So it, it, it's, it, or no, um, uh, close to 2 billion years ago. So um it, it's really very difficult for us to know where along that uh, path um, we developed um, this time of flight ability. But um, yeah, the two things that you addressed, uh, memory and forecasting or memory and planning, um, are central. And I think memory probably was the precursor because all animals or most animals have memory. Um, and the reason for memory is because um, it helps us to uh, encode past experiences, especially experiences that can be detrimental. And one of the things that um, we didn't go into tonight, but um, uh, teaching, especially transferring of knowledge from one animal to the other, either teaching of your peers or teaching of your children um, or other children. Uh, teaching information is vital to survive also. And so that can only happen if you have memory of things that have happened to you, or if you can acquire memory being taught by another animal, by, by a peer or, or a, a parent or, or another adult. Um, so memory is, is very important in all of this. Um, the planning part, I suspect, came later because planning is a more advanced um, uh, behavior. It's a more advanced, more complicated um, uh, cognitive apparatus uh, that, that um, involves, uh, it involves not just uh, understanding and, and being able to access your memory, but to uh, to create to simulate um, a version of the world where uh, you know you have a goal in mind. I mean, you have. I mean, we all have goals, but the, if you think of a goal without forecasting, if you just think of a simple goal, then it would be something that's probably easily accessible in front of you. So, for example, there's a fruit tree. You see the fruit tree. You see the fruits, and you immediately have a goal. Your mind, basically, parts of your mind, develop a goal that I want to eat that fruit because you have hunger, you know, um, that's not cognitive. That's usually by, you know, that's uh, uh, driven by other uh, sensory, uh, um, it is stimuli, it is based on your watching, seeing it, but um, it's also based on the status of your uh, um, digestive system, whether you have had food, whether your intestines are, are bulked up or not, all of these things together um, create your appetite. So if you have an appetite at the time and you see fruit, uh, delicious fruit, your intention would be to try to get it. Um, you don't have to do much planning. The planning is basically reaching up and getting it. Um, but if you are complex enough um, and you realize that you are hungry now, but you don't see a tree around you, then the planning would be, I need to find something. I need to find a tree with fruit. Or I need to find something else that I can eat. So that's the first level of planning that you know would have, would have happened. So yeah, I think that I, 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 I don't want to say there is no, but I'm not aware of any, and I doubt if there is any um, any establishment of determination of this question of when it began or either of these two began first. But in my mind, memory would have had to uh, be the precursor to planning and forecasting. Thanks, Sanjay. You're welcome. Um... Next up, I have Vanessa. But Vanessa, do you mind if I ask a question first? Go ahead. Nice, yes, thank you. Um, so I'm actually interested in the military aspect that you talked about a little bit uh, with the so, uh, soldiers and essentially um, attention bias modification training uh, that goes on, essentially how to uh, change people's brains in specifically uh, safe environments, more mild environments for that they are actually focusing on um, 
uh, they're actually focusing on uh, things that are not triggering. How does that actually work? Like, what is that? I know it's a very, uh, it's a proven technique that's been used uh, with, and, and specifically with the uh, military. Um, do you know, do you have any insights onto that? And how does that impact specifically the brain? Like the, some of the things that you covered. Okay. So there are two things, two things that I'm aware of that, that directly impact this and, and make improvements in, in a soldier's ability to deal with stressful environments, um, with environments that perhaps, uh, might've caused or may cause PTSD. So it's a very complicated, um, stressful environments. Um, two things are, are exposure and mind, mindfulness. So um, one of the researchers I linked to, Amishi um, Jiao, she actually has done a lot of research in, in the second area of mindfulness, specific with soldiers. Um, and in the video, she actually gave examples of, of one um, person that she um, interacted with over many years, over decades, um, and saw how um, he was helped by, by this. Um, so exposure is one, and mindfulness is the other. Exposure is, um, if you think about it, and this doesn't, th these two don't apply only to the military, they apply to everyone. So anyone who has Right. Um, you might say trauma, they might have fear. So for example, if you think about it this way, that fear of flying, okay, I use the example of flying, so let's stay with that. Um, somebody who has a fear of flying. Now, typically what's done is that they are, um, and I'm gonna give a few examples of this. Um, the simplest example that was done in the past was that they would be talked through. Um, in the beginning, the first stage is somebody, a, a therapist or somebody talks them and verbally walks them through the process of, fl of flying in a plane. And they would explain to them some of the ideas around that you know that that planes are even though they're heavier than air because a lot of people basically they have the fear of a plane literally falling through the ground or a cat catastrophe happening or something you know they, they have a lot of catastrophic they're, they're catastrophizing a lot that is what drives their fear so so the therapist or the person is trying to alleviate these catastrophic fears that they have by explaining that even though um, it's made of metal um, no matter what it is, as long as it's moving fast enough and the air, airfoil, you know, the wings basically form airfoil, as long as there's enough air flowing over the wings, even if it's a heavy, really heavy plane, um, it completely counteracts gravity. So giving them a little bit of a logical understanding, then giving them, um, you know, uh, they'll, they'll try to give them emotional exposure that now imagine yourself sitting in a plane. And then they might play a recording of the engine of the plane sounding up, you know, revving up. And, and again, they're sitting in the therapist's office on the ground in a sofa, but they have, they're exposed to the sound of the engine revving up with their eyes closed, just to kind of help them calm. And this might go on for several sessions where this happens. And the person is talking to them in a calm voice, in a reassuring voice. They might even be holding their hands while well, this happens. Anyway, over time, they'll be exposed. And, and once they become comfortable, once that person becomes comfortable to actually sitting in a plane, they might actually put them in a simulator first rather than a, an actual physical airplane. They might put them in a simulator and give them the sensation of sitting in a plane and watching out the window as the plane takes off. And the, and the sensations of their body of, of acceleration and deceleration, et cetera. They, you know, so this is not an example with the military, but, but basically exposure, the same thing is done with the military also where um, for example, if they are uh, going into a combat situation, um, what the military normally does, this isn't just with exposure around uh, complex situations, this is one of the techniques the military does nonetheless in all situations, is they give information, they use information to prepare the soldier for the situations that they'll uh, potentially meet. And that information in theory will help, to help them to anticipate all of the different combinations and if they can anticipate them. And also what happens is, you know, in theory that either the training will do this or the soldier will be expected to do, to do this on their own by thinking about it, that if they have information, if they, can, if they can anticipate what will happen, they can anticipate their reaction to it. They can anticipate all of the good and bad outcomes and they can anticipate what are the best paths. So it's almost like, again, they're projecting, they are using flight uh, time, they're projecting into the future a scenario where they are, they're, they're, they say, going through a building which has enemy combatants within the building, and they round a corner, and instead of actually rounding a real corner where there's a combatant there, they're going to imagine themselves doing it, and they imagine all the different scenarios. So this is an example of exposure, although what will happen is that the military also actually does this exposure in real life. They actually have real drills and real training where part of their own platoon might, half of them might act as the uh, uh, opposing forces, and they're acting as as U.S. forces, um, and they play play they role play 
So that's an example of exposure. Um, there are many, many complex examples of exposure. So the, the example of the person who's afraid of flying, they might actually ultimately put them into an airplane at the end. Okay. Um, the last example I want to give an exposure is that there are actually a lot of medication now. Uh, pro, pro, I think propanol is, is one of those. That, there's several that, that have come on the uh, line. They're not approved yet, but experimentally they're being used. Where if you give a person this medication, it it reduces the their mind's reactability to stress and fear. Basically, it calms down their limbic system. And if they're if they go through the same exposure training while their limbic system cannot or, or it has reduced ability to activate, this has been found to be the best type of exposure training. Um, and this is because these drugs are not completely um, approved for these types of uses yet. They're only experimental, and I'm not aware of the military using them experimentally. But this is this is something that seems to be the best effective. In the future, probably we will get in that direction if if safety is proven on on these medications. So that's exposure. Mindfulness is where um, you are um, helping the person use attention. So mindfulness is, and we've talked about this, you know, a few years ago. We we did, we did a lot sure. of yeah. episodes on mindfulness, but mindfulness is basically where it is attention based. You are using your attention to observe and, and you, in the beginning you're doing something in the real world with something that is actually happening so you might be observing something happening around you but you're taught to not to react and if you do react accidentally or if you do react you're not able to not to worry about it don't worry about it if you react that's fine but try to put yourself back as soon as you react accidentally put yourself back into the state where you're observing simply observing do nothing else so mindfulness is is a training methodology where you try to get the person to not react or minimize your reaction and maximize their observation of everything happening around them. And after they become good at this, after they become good at, at staying focused and not reacting and just observing, after they become good at that, then they can be put into more challenging situations. This is where the military does it, where they're put into more challenging situations where there's a threat in front of them. So after they've been practicing mindfulness and they become really good at mindfulness, at maintaining their focus and self-control. Then they're put into a real situation, not, not real as in dangerous, but simulated real situation where they have to practice in a more complex dynamic, where they actually have a threat and actually causes real stress in them. And then to exercise these muscles, these mindfulness muscles to better ways. And these have been shown to, to be very effective. Thank you for that. Yep, uh, maybe a couple of follow-ups as well for myself, but uh, we'll go to Vanessa first and then uh, Ms. Chara. Okay, uh, the mind itself, does it have some sort of like self-preservation mechanism or even survival mode? I'm thinking of the earthquake and they're still finding people like nine days later, I believe, and they found a pair of brothers and the one was keenly aware of the other. I don't know if it was mutual. And the one man was aware enough on dehydrated, you know, drinking his own urine. Are there some things that maybe the body suppresses awareness of let's say either the cold or something and even uh, the fact that the babies were found, you know, they really, I think there was a newborn. I believe the mother has since died and maybe the heat from the mother, the fact that, you know, the baby somehow managed to hold on. I know there was also um, an infant, I thought it was a newborn, but she was maybe found several days afterwards. And it's like, my gosh, you know, there's, you have this uh, person that can't feed themselves, you know, is dependent upon the mother, but somehow yet they managed to survive. Is it because maybe they're so limited Awareness and experience, maybe the better word, and memory. Yeah, so um, a lot of the um, questions and the examples you gave are around survival in extreme uh, dangerous situations like an earthquake. Um, I mean, this the survival instinct is very, very strong, and it's not only awareness that's part of that. There are many, many aspects to our behavior that come into play. But um, awareness can be, awareness especially, can be helpful to give us hope. Because in, one of the things in, in survival is that if you lose hope, your chances of survival diminish drastically. So having hope, having the ability to look for solutions, you know, because if you if you don't look for solutions, you're not going to make your situation better in a in a, 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 a challenging survival situation. So um, hope is one aspect, but um, also you're you you have to use you are using your attention all the time. Um, attention <clears throat> rarely. Um, diminishes to the level. Even if you're buried underneath rubble and it's very dark, um, <clears throat> probably what will happen, and I've never been in it, but I've read of accounts and stories. Um, and what what my understanding is that um, many of the of the um, 
perceptual um, systems of the person became heightened, they become amplified. So for example, their ability to detect vibration. Normally we're not very good at detecting vibration, but in that situation they, and usually because they're pinned under something or you know their body is physically in contact with a lot of things, um, concrete or other things, but and vibration travels through matter. So, um, but the fact is that their body has become more attuned and part of it might be because what the brain does is it amplifies and it magnifies its the, um, the sensations coming into it. So if you're stuck in the place in a dark, you know, it might not be 100% dark, completely dark, you might have a little bit of light coming in. But if you if you have very little normal stimuli coming in, what your brain automatically does after a few hours and actually really does this after a few days, is it, it starts to take the little bit of stimuli you're getting and it starts to amplify them and focus them on them more because there's so much so little stimuli. This is what happens in sensory deprivation chamber also. And this is also, there can be negative aspects to it for that also. But um, in a survival situation like that, you can actually, you will start to feel more, for example, vibration. And so if you sense that there's somebody, and this is the reason why a lot of the res rescuers, they go around tapping and knocking on pieces of, of rubble, just because they know that it'll travel, that sound and that sensation will travel far. And if there's somebody alive, that person will try to communicate in some way. They might make a sound, they might do something, um, to let others know that they're, they're, someone is there. They're, so um, for adults, these things can work. For the baby, I think it's probably, I mean, if the, the baby was, was um, I don't know if the baby necessarily was aware that her, I think it was a, a girl, that her mother was dead or not. I don't think she necessarily would have been aware. Again, we can't be sure. I, you know, I haven't heard of any accounts of this, but it would be very difficult for a baby to be aware whether her mother was actually living or dead. Um, because one thing, a lot of babies, depending on the age, they really don't know what death in life is. All they know is movement and action and, and interaction. So if the mother is not interacting, it might think that the mother is sleeping because it's aware that mothers sleep. Um, so it might not understand death in that sense. Um, and if the mother has died and the body is still close, it still would get sensory, for example, it would be able to smell the mother to some extent. Um, and if, if it hasn't been too many hours, it might even feel the warmth of the, of the mother, as you said. So it's very complicated. It's not easy to tell. Um, but um, attention is, is important in survival. It's not the only thing that's important. There are many, many other things that come to play. Uh, Ms. Tara. Hi. Um, I great presentation. I have a question about um, your thoughts on certain kinds of uh, disorders, I guess, like um, like ADHD, ADD, executive dysfunction, and things like that. Um, would you consider those to be more of like a, not necessarily a disorder, but like a, a different kind of processing in the brain? Or, or would it be considered like I guess like disordered at a clinical level. So um, yeah, there's two thoughts on this, um, and, and I'm not a therapist, so that's not. Um, I'm I'm going to give you my understanding based on what I've read about this. There are two primary ways of looking at this. One is the more traditional historical way of looking at these as a disorder, um, but a lot of uh, newer therapists and, and the uh, healthcare community, the mental health community, is using a different model now where um, basically the concept of neuro neurodivergence um, is uh, being used more often to uh, characterize people with uh, exam, you know, ADHD or other types of, of, of executive function uh, um, PFC disorders. And they, I mean, it, I think it helps more to understand uh, these um, complex dynamics processing uh, characteristics as a divergence. Uh, but you don't want to take it too far because there, there are cases, there are situations where um, the divergence, the amount of divergence that a specific person has is so far away from what's known as normal, as, as, as typical case, that it becomes dysfunctional to some level. They're not able to do a lot of things. So um, typically, if it's a person that's high functioning, um, it's, today most, most um, therapists call that an aspect of neurodivergence. 
Um, it's not typically seen as a you know traditional disorder where they um, don't have ability to do things they typically do because they're high functioning. But somebody on the other end where they um, and not not ADHD but let's say autism, if the person cannot make eye contact, they have such extreme difficulty communicating with any other person um, other than let's say a family member. They, that might be the only person they can communicate with and, and nobody else or very, very few others. Um, that would be pretty debilitating to the point where they cannot really function um, socially. They can function on their own if they're alone and they can eat and they can do things on their own. But in terms of interacting in society, they might not be able to. So that might be um, still termed um, uh, aspects of disorder. So there, there's no right or wrong here, but uh, my understanding is that the mental health community is, is looking at these a lot of these more as neurodivergent aspects of neurodivergence. Thank you. Uh, Rapali. Thank you. Um, this is a very nice presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, how do you train children to uh, go from kind of the stage of confusion towards attention, um, piggybacking on the previous scholars' thoughts about ADHD or um, lack of attention, maybe they're distracted because their mind can only hold so much uh, attention for so long. So what, any thoughts on how to uh, kind of improve attention? So um, a lot of the, um, the um, processing, uh, the if if a child it it, it depends a lot I mean I, I can't talk about therapeutic uh, methodology I this is very difficult to really um, I mean there are many I, I can talk about some of the aspects to it but as far as how do you make things better for a particular children um, that's not I'm not trained in that um, but I think and a lot of it also depends on the specific nature of what um, is happening in the brain. Um, if they don't have, uh, if they can't even uh, perceive certain aspects of the world around them, then it would be much more difficult for them to have attention because that information is just not getting to the right areas of the brain. Or it might be that the communication within the brain, this is actually typical of, of ADHD where the communication is, is excessive. So it, what might be happening is that they're overwhelmed with the amount of um, understanding their attention of what's what's happening around them, and it makes it very difficult for them to um, uh, focus to, for them to to uh, not just focus in general, but to even focus on any one aspect of the things around them. So, for example, if a person is talking to teachers, is speaking directly at them, and in the background behind them, there's another student talking. Um, to someone who doesn't have that condition, they would be able to block out the student behind them, and they would not basically they would not hear them. Um, but a person with, with a more severe form of ADHD probably will hear more of that student talking behind them and it will come into their consciousness and, aware, and awareness. And you can't tell the student to ignore it. That wouldn't work. So the question, and, and this is the reason why a lot of these are really handled through medication, because a lot of these situations are really, um, they are uh, the processing the types of information, the, the way information flows within the brain, the speed at which it flows within the brain, the extent to which it flows within the brain and the regions that it, that it communicates within is uh, not how it is in people without that, that condition. So medications are used to attenuate signal flow, for example, um, which has side effects. They actually attenuate not just the signals that you want to attenuate, they, they reduce all types of signals. So there, there are you know, other consequences to that. Um, it's not something you can talk to or train a child, I don't believe. Um, you can probably give them suggestions. For example, look at the teacher's face when they're talking to you, okay? Because what that will do is that will make more of their brain. It will make, because a lot of times what happens is that the student is, is not focusing. They literally are not looking at the teacher. They're, they're, their eyes are wandering. And so you might be able to teach them to do some less things like that. For example, you might tell them to specifically focus on the lips or focus on the eyes or even focus on their own hands, something like that, that will, that will prevent 
the amount of information that's coming in from the outside and let them their brain handle basically you're reducing the amount of information that's that's coming into the brain if their eyes are not wandering automatically you're reducing the amount of information so those techniques i suspect might help a little bit but again it depends on the on the exact condition that the, the child has um, i think medication is, is one of the things that is necessary in a lot of these especially if it's if it's uh, not a high function person then medication typically is is necessary because it is um, a processing um, change, a difference in how their brain processes information, processes energy, um, energy that flows between neurons. So um, I think that that's an aspect that we can't overlook. So DLJ, did you have your follow up? Yep, I see you do. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is good. Thanks very much. Um, so there was a, I didn't quite catch what you said. Do, do you think stress causes confusion or confusion causes stress? So what I'm getting at here is whether, um, because both of those things, confusion and stress are both our interpretation of what's going on in the system. You see what I mean? So so we've got yeah. the, the monitoring and then we've got the monitoring of the monitoring. So it's the, and the monitoring of the monitoring, and we can go on forever. Um, so is, Confusion, our interpretation of stress, or is stress our interpretation, the 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 monitor the monitoring system's interpretation of confusion, or is you get the idea? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so again, this is this is why um, this topic. I I was, well, I wasn't headed. I, I I realized that if we go too deep into this question is fine. I think we can answer this, but if we go too deep into it, it becomes very very much more difficult to delve into all of the different compound effects of the initial processing that happens. So the quick answer is that stress causes confusion first. Okay, that's the main effect. That's not the main, it's one of the effects. I mean, stress, and actually, so let me say it another way. Um, I, I want to say it in a general way, but that might not make as much sense. I mean, it will be more correct, but it might not make as much sense. But let me try. So, Go so on. the initial information, the energy that mm -hmm. our brain gets, for example, yeah. stress, okay, that permeates into many regions, um, and that will cause responses in each of those many regions. Okay, and those responses in each of those regions might activate secondary responses in some or all or none of those other regions. Right? It will it will elicit secondary responses. Those secondary responses then will flow between and among other regions. And those interactions may cause other effects, which may cause tertiary responses and all of that. And in the meantime, some of this or all of this is going to the attention center of the brain, i.e. you might think of it as a consciousness center, although I believe they're distinct, but they're, they're interrelated. So while this is happening, and this is, this is part of what we saw with the video with Orrin Hatch when we got confused, that, and that's why I, I, I um, tried to show three different slides of his mental state. And you can kind of see, you know, uh, we're assuming exactly what those um, different facial expressions mean, but, you know, in a sense, we kind of have a sense that they are different and they, they, ref they reflect different uh, things happening in his mind. And we probably, we attribute our own feelings over him and this is probably, so when I said he probably was, was feeling embarrassed toward the end, that last slide, the third one, he was probably feeling embarrassed because typically that's what would happen to a person. You're sitting in front of an audience, cameras, the whole country or the whole world can see you. You do something like that. Um, and, you know, it's obvious that that was a mistake. It was silly. You understand that. So you don't think it's catastrophic. It's not earth shattering, but it's a little bit embarrassing. So that's what his facial expression showed. So that example where his facial expression went from total confusion in the beginning, where his eyes were completely down, his lips were just partly open. Um, and that's the first initial reaction. And actually, if you delve into it, because you have to remember that, that signals travel within the brain very, very quickly. Although, you know, that episode of about two seconds, um, it would have been several million interactions between billions of neurons. Okay, and we can't slice through all of those billions of neurons in every single millisecond of time. We can't slice through that. We're doing it in, let's say, uh, 200 millisecond, you know, one, one, one fifth of a second 
uh, time intervals. We can look at it from that point of view. So we're looking at from a point of view micro expressions that a person would have. So in that point of view, it's easier for us to understand. But what's happening inside the brain is even at a finer gradation, finer detail, which we can't um, elicit yet. We don't have the tools or ability to. We can only conjecture on what's happening based on the larger global sense of what we're seeing on their face. And we can actually do this through MRI also, where we see the changes in MRI. But again, MRI is also not that fast. Um, MRI is one of the, it's fast compared to human time. But in terms of how fast the brain works, MRI can't keep up with the brain. So, um, so the stress is first. Um, typically, the energy, the initial energy that causes um, us to fall on that continuum of attention is first. And then we are, our position on that continuum shifts. And that shifting causes the response in our brain in one or more regions. That response may be reflected in our attention center, which may actually then end up on our face. And then that second response may go into other areas which cause a tertiary response with half a second later show up in our attention and our face again. So this is the reason why we have micro expressions that change over time as something like that, that confusion that we saw as it occurs. His facial expression changed and we could kind of, you know, we were interpreting that he was totally confused at the beginning. Then he realized that he's confused, but he was less confused because he realized it because obviously he understood then that what happened was confusion. So realizing confusion is less confusion. And that showed up on his face. And then eventually he realized that not, that the confusion is over. Now he realized where he's sitting in the Senate. And then the embarrassment comes in. So, so th that's the, you know, so yes, confusion does cause stress, but that's, that was the later. So the embarrassment was an outcome of that stress, the embarrassment that he felt. So the confusion caused stress toward the end and that stress caused embarrassment. Right. That was toward the end. Yeah. So there's a loop going on. Um, interesting example you chose because of course people on the autistic spectrum, not all, um, actually have trouble interpreting, interpreting facial expressions. So you showed those slides. I wasn't getting it because I'm on okay, that. Sorry. So, <laughs> so a good example. Uh, could we therefore just just quick? Because I know uh, other people are waiting. Uh, could we therefore maybe uh, think of the initial stress as conflicts in sensory input, or rather the the, the reading of you know? What I mean? So we've got two 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 or many bits of information that we're going. Hang on, these don't match. So that's the initial stress, which causes confusion, which causes stress. Yeah, is that what? We, well, well the, well, the initial confusion can be, it, it's, it's actually very complicated. So the initial, no, the initial stress. Yes, initial stress, right? That's what yeah. I'm talking about. The, yeah. well, well, it depends. The initial stress might come completely from the outside. Yes. Okay. That's one possibility. Or the initial stress might be formed from inside the brain based on, based on normal signals, for example, visual signals coming in. Yeah. So, for example, somebody who has processing uh, uh, differences, they process... For example, somebody who, who isn't able to understand a facial expression, their their processing, sorry, their, their their perception of the signals is correct. It goes into the the um, uh, right. um, visual system. It's initially processed there correctly as a face. Right. It's initially processed as eyes, net mouth, etc., and then it goes into other areas, and that's where the processing isn't either completed. Or, um, you know, so, 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 for example, if they are not able to, to understand the facial expression that they saw the person on the, on the other person's face, then that might cause, um, it can cause any number of things. One might be stress, right, which would cause confusion. Mm. It might be fear, right? It can cause, um, it can cause um, embarrassment. Well, I mean, again, each person is different depending on, the pattern of history that they have. So it might be that a child has learned to become ashamed of this. Okay. So in that child, after they've learned that, the initial sensation might be of, of embarrassment and not of stress. Okay. But before they learned that embarrassment, they probably would have had stress initially. Or actually, they wouldn't have had stress at all because before that, before they're even aware that they're not picking up on the signal, they wouldn't have anything. Right. Their visual system would have decoded to a certain point and this and the, the path ends then. Basically, the path goes to their awareness center, which tells them there's a face in front of them. It doesn't tell them anything more about the face. It just says there's a face there, yeah. and they're fine with it. 
So this is the reason why children, when they're young, with uh, some of these uh, conditions, they don't aware, they're not, and even other conditions, um, we're not aware of it. So somebody who might have a hearing disability, they might not be aware of it because they don't know that other people's brains or other people's ears work differently. They just don't know. How do you find out? You find out by communicating and learning that. Okay, uh, okay, Sanjay, we all, yeah, so we have a few people that want to ask questions here. And uh, yeah. so maybe if you can keep your answers brief, uh, so that way, you know, finish at a regular uh, hour. Thank you, DLJ. Uh, Vanessa, followed by Ms. Chara, followed by Madeline. Yeah, what about a slightly different experience with confusion, maybe more like per, um, perplexion? I was watching that video about that car ad and making such a big deal. I'm trying to think, is he talking about the scooter, the car? And then when he was talking about the alloy wheels and such, I'm like, wait a minute, the store, it's slightly different color, but I realized that the name of the store changed and other things. So like the fact that, wait, it's not adding up. Did that maybe increase my focus? The fact that, wait a minute, what's the big deal here? And then I was attuned to something and like, stop, wait a minute, something's up here. Right. Right. So um, let me just give an ex explain to others who might not have seen that. In one of the videos, they, they had a scene where um, the, the presenter gave a short a short video. And basically, the video was was a, a real car commercial, a foreign car commercial um, in Europe. And they had a car sitting on the street and there was a, a you know, a street um, behind it, buildings and, and different things around. There's another car next to it, et cetera, a bicycle, et cetera. And what you noticed what was prominent was that as the commercial played for about a minute. Um, it was flickering about every half a second or every one second, it would flicker. And that was intentional. A lot of people might not have realized that, but that was intentional. That was part of this. If, it, if there was no flicker, uh, this would not have happened. But basically, as the commercial progressed, um, what we were supposed to, we, most people didn't know this, but to some extent you might have noticed, is that different aspects of the scene other than the car, the car remained identical. And the voiceover was describing the car and talking about the car in the commercial, um, that this is a car, you know, et cetera, you know, whatever. But other aspects of the scene around the car were slightly changing every flicker. So the bicycle might not, might, might have had a, a, a different tire after the first flicker. And the color of a window in the second flicker after the second flicker might have changed. And then after the third flicker, there's a car in front of that car, which changed to a truck. And basically, as this happens over and over and over, and after about a minute, the scene is completely different other than the car. And because of the changes are happening so gradually, most people don't notice it. Now, in my case, what happened, and I had never seen this before, first time I had a sensation that something changed in the bicycle, but I wasn't sure. And this is what happens. What, what, what happens in us is that, and again, this is about awareness, that my conscious awareness or the awareness center of my brain was not aware of distinct changes, but lower processing levels of my brain was aware that things were changing. But that information about the change, in the beginning, it went to my parental center. And I had a slight realization that something changed in the bicycle, but I couldn't pinpoint what. I, I had a feeling something changed, and I couldn't go more into it. But anyway, so that, that's what the question is. And the flickering was very important because if there's no flickering there, um, our visual system is very, very focused on primed on detecting immediate changes. When, that's the reason why we can do motion tracking, because motion tracking is where something, an object, literally moves from one spot to another quickly. It might be a fly, but we can still track it, or a tennis ball, we can still track it because our, our brain is so tuned to that. But if there's a flicker between it, we lose um, um, uh, the traceability of it. Thank you, Sanjay. So, uh, next up is Ms. Chara. Oh, sorry. I had a follow-up um, question about um, about conditions like uh, like autism, or um, I guess like in the beginning of the presentation, you had um, also mentioned like uh, like schizophrenia and other kinds of uh, psychotic disorders. Um, what are your thoughts on those kind of like those mental processes being driven by like underlying metabolic conditions um, as opposed to some kind of, I guess, like deficiency of the brain? Yeah, I mean, so they wouldn't necessarily be metabolic because that would affect energy. Um, and, and my understanding is that, uh, I mean, it might be that there is a slight difference in the amount of energy available to each neuron. But 
um, from my understanding, that wouldn't necessarily cause these types of conditions. They might cause other conditions. They, they probably do cause other conditions. But these conditions are um, uh, due to the information that's flowing between neurons and between regions and disruption usually in, in that information. Um, so it wouldn't be uh, metabolic. Um, the, cause, the causality wouldn't be from uh, metabolism, but um, it definitely is. Um, it might be sometimes there are structural differences, um, but um, the signal flow, neurotransmitter flow, um, that is uh, best understood today as causing a lot of these, uh, these conditions. Uh, so next up, we have Madeline. Yes, well, uh, some of you saw in chat, I too could not distinguish between those little uh, expressions. I had read that uh, there are people in different professions are better at uh, distinguishing them. Um, the doctors and secret service agents are very high on the top of the list at distinguishing all those little expressions and what they mean. Uh, my question was really about facial recognition. Uh, actually, it's a two-part question. So one is about facial recognition. Is it thought that this um, prosop agnosia, the inability to recognize familiar faces, is might exist on a spectrum um, with being able to detect differences in facial expression and determining what they mean? or those two different kinds of brain functions. And my other question is, goes back to something you, you either did a presentation on or just mentioned during one, that there's a part of the brain that's, um, that's kind of dedicated to perceiving eyes and mouths. And so eyes and teeth are very important to it. Um, what was that called again? So um, there's FFA, the fusif uh, fusiform facial area. Okay, thank you. But but it's 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 actually pretty complicated. It's not just eyes and nose and and, and it's not teeth. Usually teeth are not part of it. Although um, I mean it can. It, it it depends on in in animals where f where recognizing teeth and teeth shape and prominence of teeth are more important. Uh, for example, baboons in in and certain animals the teeth area is more enhanced. Um, in humans, it seems to be less, but basically the, the basically a triangle, triangulation of the two eyes and the nose and the mouth technically doesn't even have to be there, but, but that's the region that in, uh, in many, most animals, but definitely in all humans, um, we have a region, but that region may uh, not function um, fully in, in everyone. And it seems to be, you, you asked a question about whether it, it falls on a spectrum, it seems to be um, some of the, that there, there's been um, back and forth, but one of the research that I've followed on this um, seems to have made a pretty definitive case that it probably is um, uh, on, on, on a spectrum. So that, to me, that, that's, uh, that makes more sense. Okay, thanks. Um, if there and, and are just, no uh, other... Are, are there other questions? Uh, if, if there aren't, no, I just want to address... So, 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 okay. Yeah, so I just yeah, want to address... I was gonna, I, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask a question, but that really um, yeah, I'll just quickly address something that Madeline asked in the chat about the um, the uh, you know the the slides about um, the Orrin Hatch um, video. So you know, um, yeah, I I didn't want to. I mean, I can go back and show those, but if you watch, basically, I mean, not to say that I am really good at this, but I, I watched the video and I was paying attention to the video and I spent time extracting the the faces from the video. So for me, it's obviously easier to look at and describe. And I suspect if you looked at it in slow motion, or if you, I, I could play the video in slow motion, in slower motion, and it would help because understanding the differences in the facial expressions is easier if you see the difference from one expression to the next. And I mean, I don't know if you want me to try to do that. I, I can do it where, let me, let me do it this way. Um, I think it's e easy. Let me, um, I need to get to that's that. the LJ's question as well. I think. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, that's why I wanted to cover it because several people um, raised this, and I want us to have an intuitive understanding. That to me, that's always a better way of understanding things. Um, so, let me try to. Uh, Do you want to go to, back to that or? That yeah, that's what I'm, I'm just bringing up the slide uh, right now. So, uh, so I think um, it should be. Visible. Let me move this out of the way. Ah, what is it doing? Okay, so 
Can you see the, the video ready to, to run? Let me start the video. So the video is running now. It'll, it'll loop over and over. Okay, so just get, get a sense of what, what's happening and how long it runs for and like that. Um, and then I'll go to the individual frames and I'll try to show those. All right, and I'm going to stop the video now and let me go to the next slide. So this is the, the first slide where he's realized. I'm going to just flip back and forth between the two. All right, do you, do you see? I don't know if it's, if it's fast enough that you can see the difference. Um, I mean, the, his eyes, the amount of, that his eyes and are... And he's open. feeling what? Shame? Or is he feeling confusion? What, what is it? So the first, first slide, this is the first slide. This is where he's feeling total confusion. What, okay. how, like basically, if you think about it, he reached up to get his glasses. His fingers touched empty air. Okay, and that's where he is. He's stuck there. His move, hand moved slightly down maybe two centimeters down, but basically his fingers just touched, his thumb touched his four fingers, it touched empty air, and he's confused because he wanted to bring his glasses off his face and his fingers touched empty air. He doesn't understand. He hasn't realized his glasses are missing yet. All he's realized is his fingers touched and something's not right. That's what he's realized at this point. So it's confusion, okay? Now, I'm not saying that that Everybody should be able to read his face and understand that that's what confusion means. But people who have, who have looked at, at facial expressions who have who've done the analysis of this, they say that this, uh, some of the things that, that he's showing right now are aspects of confusion. So for example, the eyes being droopy, almost closed, the eyes being more closed than they were before. Um, like in the video, his eyes were fully open. Let me see if I can go back to the previous slide where the video is running. Um, and you, it's, it happens quickly. See, his eyes are open when he's looking. He's looking straight ahead when he's trying to get the glasses off. Can you see that? As, as his fingers clasp on the invisible glasses, his eyes are fully open. Do you see that? If you see that, yeah. then you realize that immediately after his eyes closed, and that's what we're talking about, is that his eyes are fully open, right? Let, let, me, let me try to go back and pause when his eyes are open. It might, I don't know in this video if I can do that as well. I'm, I'm going to move this up here. Let me. Yeah. Let me try to move it so it's okay. So so he's he's reaching up to get his eyeglasses, right? His fingers haven't clasped yet. Now they're starting to clasp. Okay, his fingers are moving together, right? Now they're moving together, and all of a sudden he's real. So so see see this is the moment where this is where his eyes are fully open. Okay. There's no confusion because he thinks that his glasses are there. His fingers haven't touched anything, but his, his fingers aren't close enough that he would have any sensation of missing glasses, right? But the next moment is when his fingers are starting to come together and they're empty and they're touching empty air. And now his fingers are moving down. So now he's realized the glasses are missing and his eyes have partly drooped now before. Do you notice that from, from his eyes being open now, fully open to partly drooped? And then if you go down, now they're almost closed. See the difference? Right. So his eyes are indicating his facial, his, his internal state. This happens a lot. Our eyes are, are, you know, we talk about the eye being the center of the soul. It's not, I don't think that's completely true, but the eyes do give information about the state of our mind. And that's what's happening here. One of the things, his, his lips also, if you see his lips, right? Initially, his lips are closed. Then they're open. They get more open when he realizes that the glasses are not there. His lips are more open. That's another aspect of confusion and, and several of these emotions. And then his lips, and then his so, lips are cooked. Yeah, I think uh, I think we probably exhausted this maybe with awareness, uh, you know, as far as yep. yeah, the topic itself. Um, yeah, actually, I just had a very, I mean, I had a couple of questions. I think that there's some really interesting following topics here, especially when it comes to. I have new insights into like CBT, essentially, but some of the thoughts and how they actually can change your perspective on the world. Um, but just really quickly, uh, you talked about some of the, the idea of playing tennis, but not paying attention to the details. Are you just referring to something like system one and system two, where you essentially you're, 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 or is it something different? It's, it's no, it's much more than that. I mean, system one and system two are basically where, um, 
two parts of the simplest version. And the system one, system two is actually, it's much more complicated. I actually talk about, there's also a system zero and, and you know, it's much more complicated than just that. So system one, system two is a simplified version of it, extremely simplified version of it. But system one, system two is where you have two parts of your mind. Your, your, you might say the limbic system, which is system one, the fast acting, and you have your uh, cerebrum, which is the system two, the, the slower acting. And these two systems are both active. In, and so in, in this presentation, when I talked about multiple regions of the brain, that's another aspect of this, where we have our limbic system is, is looking at the world, trying to figure things out, as well as our, our uh, uh, cranial cortex. It's also doing the same thing. And both of these systems will have different versions of information. They'll have different states of information. That's what I said earlier, right? Um, and if these systems have a difference in the states, that information will get sent to our attention center. But mm -hmm. the difference in system one, system two, is that the information from the limbic system gets decided in a sense much, much sooner. And it gets sent to our attention center much sooner. Mm -hmm. okay? And our attention center then takes that and runs with it. Because our, because our limbic system has usually been activated strongly at that point with system one meaning there's strong emotion and it, it, it wants us to do something quickly. So it sends a type of message which our attention center grabs right away and runs with it. It doesn't wait for system two. It doesn't wait for our thinking mind to, right. to figure it out. Right? That's what system wants us to right. do. So that's one aspect of what I'm talking about, but it's not the whole thing. This, that's one example. Yeah, because I was just thinking about it. I was just thinking about it in terms of the example that you used. The person knows they're playing tennis, but they're not paying attention to the details that they're playing tennis. Yeah, so, so in that tennis, that would happen because there's... Yeah, in tennis, yeah, that would not, it, it would not be, it would not be system one, system two. In tennis, it would be actually the cerebellum, which is neither of these systems. It's actually, it's in, in the model that I have, it would actually be a system point five, which I usually don't, instead of the system zero, system one, system two, you can think of it as a system 0 0.5, the cerebellum. But that's, I don't want to describe that because it's, it's more complicated. It is more real. It is more realistic with what's actually happening in our brain, but I don't think, um, I can explain it quickly enough um, but but yeah the cerebellum okay. and the and the uh, cortex those are the two that are competing when you're playing tennis but the yes. fact that your awareness knows you're playing tennis they're actually not competing they become cooperative at the end where your cerebellum basically lets the cerebrum do what it wants the cerebrum sends signals through the cerebellum so sorry the cerebellum sends signals through the cortex through the cerebrum and it directly goes to the muscles so it so that's why a good tennis player um, doesn't have to do any thinking. It it's, seems auto, almost automatic to them, but it's not system one, system Matt, two. Let's give the last question to uh, Madeline. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sanjay. You're, you're welcome. So my question is kind of related to this. Um, I realize that that um, the the type of memory involved in time flight isn't a muscle memory specifically like playing tennis. But it, your example of tennis made me think, okay, memory, in a sense, memory is a habit, uh, yes. one could say. And I'm just, one, I'm just thinking, okay, that relates to how worry and anxiety can become a habit of rumination. So that same, um, that same habit of memory that can be very healthy uh, and necessary for survival can turn either, either into sort of chronic regrets about something in the past, just as the, um, the forecasting of future scenarios that going over them, over them again can turn into chronic anxiety. So a, a, a habit of repetition can get overdone in either direction, past or future. Right. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, act actually, aspects of this, when we're talking about habit and memory, it's actually much more complicated than that. Um, but yes, you're, you're definitely in the right track. And, and everything you said, I agree with. I, I think that's how it happens um, in, in animals. Um, uh, and other aspects of that also are that memory and, and habits also can be genetic. Um, I mean, we don't think of them as that way, but if you think about simply what the brain is doing or how the brain uh, exists, 
we start to realize that, for example, um, some animals, for example, um, uh, uh, horses, when they're born, um, an infant horse instantly has a sense of balance and it can come up and stand on its legs. Um, it doesn't have to learn how to stand, whereas an infant baby and many other um, animals have to actually learn how to walk. They cannot walk um, on, on the first seconds of, of after birth, but horses can. And the reason is because aspects of that behavior of how to walk and balance um, is encoded physically in their brain, whereas that encoding for a human baby takes time, it takes months, and it happens through actual experience. Um, so that's an example where uh, the memory of walking is hardwired into a horse's brain, um, but in a human brain, it's uh, learned. So I said Madeline would be the last question, but it will actually give it to Judy. Okay, thank you. She hasn't uh, asked yet. I'll, I'll try to be really quick. Um, no, I, this is totally different than what you were saying. Uh, it's, it's not scientific at all. It's, it, but attention. I want to go back to the word, uh, the concept of attention. It reminded me of a book I read a long time ago in the 1960s called Island by Aldous Huxley, and he had these birds in this island, and the birds kept saying to the citizens of this island, attention, attention, attention. And the people that visited this island did not understand what attention meant. So they would keep asking, attention to what? <laughs> attention to attention. And the whole book is a, it's an a utopia book, a utopic book. Um, and it, it reminds people of the dangers of technology and all the other things way back in the 1960s so it's it's fascinating that i hadn't thought of this in you know 40 50 years because but the word attention brought that that back that i never forgot that little, that little bird saying attention attention so i just wanted to share that that's wonderful yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating uh, yeah it's Maybe a follow on topic is actually how technology impacts our attention. Uh, I did talk about that in the videos a little bit, uh, but uh, maybe go into that a little bit deeper. Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, we'll do some uh, just quick announcements for upcoming events. Uh, Gospel John is on uh, tomorrow evening, and that'll be on chapter 15. Design Your Life, Second Innings, uh, that is a, going to be an interesting meetup. It's going to be using some of the traditional texts that we've been studying and uh, Jungian psychology and how that actually goes into um, uh, reinventing yourself. Uh, so, and then what is that? we what have, is that? that's Design Your Life on uh, Friday. What's the name Friday of the evening. The title design your life design your life uh, second innings thank you um and then we have our bucky series with uh doug jacobs um and that will be on uh sunday evening at nine so uh thank you everyone i appreciate it it's good seeing everyone and uh hope to oh, see everyone again soon go, the bucky series is that buckmeister fuller or someone yeah. Oh, yep. okay, okay. Thank you. No problem. All right, thanks everyone. All right, take care. Good Have question. you been to a Bucky series? Me? Have you been to it? Yeah. Um, I was in some of the earlier ones, not the recent ones. Okay. But I mean, I love Bucky. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. I'm right. oh, sorry. Is it on, is it on Sunday? Yeah. Sunday at nine and Doug is actually, yeah, he's excellent. So uh, he's an interesting uh, uh, individual. He understands both the geometry and the literary aspect of things. So I think that that's, that's really gonna be an interesting meetup. So, all right, have a good evening, everyone.